From prison to peace, building on experience partnership. It's in the luxurious surroundings of the Hilton Hotel out at Temple Patrick. And a number of former prisoners will be coming together. Uh, former members of the IRA, UDA, UVF, INLA and official IRA to name but a few. Now let me say hello to Jared Foster, who is a former prisoner. Jared, good morning. Uh, good morning, Frank. You're a former member of the INLA. That's correct. Now, the spotlight will very much be on prisoners and the future for prisoners, especially with the recent news about Mary McArdle becoming a special advisor at Stormont. And she seems to be the only prisoner that has been spoken about over the past uh, couple of weeks. How do you view the coverage of that particular story, Gerard? Well, it's, for me, it seems to be that the media grabbed it and ran with it, and it's now sort of taking a life of its own. And they're concentrating on the one issue, uh, around uh, Mary McArdle's appointment of the job and not taking into account the, that there was more ex-prisoners than Mary, uh, Mary McArdle. There are, of course, more ex-prisoners than Mary McArdle and I think the Travers family have said time and again there are more victims than the Travers family themselves. H- having said that, whenever there's a major meeting like the meeting you're having with former members of the provisionals, the UDA, the UVF, the officials and the INLA all together, people can't help but instantly think of the victims that you would have left in your wake, you and the other people that you will be meeting today? Well, uh, one of the issues that we deal with as ex-prisoners is the victims, and we do work with victims. We work with the families of British soldiers who were killed here. We work with uh, former RUC and UDR personnel. We work with, with the, within the victim and survivor sector. Uh, we actually do quite a bit of work, and we're very sensitive to that work and to the victims and survivors of the conflict. And we, we deal with it in as sensitive a, a way as possible, so we do. Do you think sensitivity was totally lacking from Sinn Féin's perspective? Uh, uh, that, I, mean, I, would, I would imagine that Sinn Féin can answer for themselves in that, but uh, coming from an ex-prisoner background, uh, what I would say is uh, people are saying that uh, Mary shouldn't have got this job because it's publicly funded. So what is it they're actually trying to say? We shouldn't get health care, we shouldn't get education, we shouldn't get anything that is publicly funded. Where do they want this to stop? Where are they going to try and draw a line? I think what people have been saying, especially people who have been contacting this programme over the past couple of weeks, they're saying that she shouldn't have a job that in any way causes offence to the victim that she left in her wake. Well, that's where I get confused. Then what type of job are they saying that we should be entitled to? And what sort of job do you believe that former provisionals, former UDA members, former UVF members, former INLA members should be entitled to? I don't expect you to speak for the other groups, but when we think about the INLA, we think about, say, the Ballykelly dropping well pub bomb. We think about the the killing of Airy Neve. We we think about a number of police officers who were killed. We think about internal feuds and disputes and and, uh, drug deals as, as well. We also... We also think about the Darkley shooting, where it was claimed by the Catholic Reaction Force, but there was an INLA member held to account for for that particular uh, for, for that particular atrocity. In relation to the image and memory of Ireland, when you think INLA, you do think horror and death, destruction, and a, a legacy that very few people would be proud of. Well, you spoke about darkly there, and if I remember correctly at the time, the INLA leadership actually condemned it. And during the, the, the ceasefire the statement, they stated that there was actions carried out by the INLA that could not be justified and were wrong. That included sectarian killings. Uh, we've, we are now, within in Chapman Falsha, are working with a way of truth recovery within our organisation. And we're trying to, to, to deal with the past in a way that could be helpful, not just uh, within the Republican community, because a lot of a lot of victims of Republican uh, actions, I think actually most of them were from our own community, and so we we're trying to get a way of, that we we can deal with this this issue in dealing with victims. Uh, but we have no qualms within within the NLA prisoners group. If, if an action was wrong, it was wrong, and we will say it was wrong. Uh, but to take the whole conflict and try and ask us to uh, apologise for the whole conflict. You've got to remember, those involved in the conflict were not the cause of the conflict. There's all people out there aren't being asked to uh, stand up to the mark here about their actions in the past, 
about speeches that were made by politicians threatening the, the fate and died at our last drop of blood. And yet, you know, where are they now? They, these were the sort of things that inspired young men and women to get involved in conflict, believing that they were, they, they were doing it because certain levels of society accepted it. And we're talking about fighting and dying. And young people got involved in the conflict, and then these people run away from them. And they haven't dealt with the past in any shape or form. They got Eames and Bradley to do a bit of it, and now that's been put on the shelf, it's just gathering dust. The people in political, the political arena seem to be hard scared of dealing with the past, and maybe rightly so, because it may drag up their own past. The people involved in the conflict were not the only ones responsible for the conflict, and wider society needs to, to take that on board. As you said at the meeting today, Jared, with other paramilitary, former paramilitary members and former paramilitary prisoners, do you regret your involvement in the INLA? We've all got regrets, but if I was to start talking about regrets, it would probably sound selfish. There, yes, I, I regret that things happened, that the political situation in this country, the abnormal political situation in this country, led to conflict. And we're trying to deal with that conflict uh, and the legacy of that conflict. Then, and there's people shying away from, from their part in it. And they're looking the likes of myself and the loyalist ex-prisoners to, to come out and never apologize or stand up and admit things that we've done. Yet they're standing in the background and, and won't do that. I mean, we have politicians elected in this country who are ex-prisoners. Peter Robinson's an ex-prisoner. Martin McGuinness is an ex-prisoner. But as it comes on down the lane, it's... it's the further down the food chain you seem to go, they want us to stand up to the mark, but no one else stands up to the mark. I mean, we, wider society needs to take a look at this conflict and what happened in it and who were the leaders in it and how did, how did it pan out and where we are today. People also don't want to uh, acknowledge that the, the political process that we're in today, peace process if you want to call it that, actually started with the prisoners in the prisons. And, and it's, it's led us to where we are today. The massive role that prisoners are playing, and, are, and we're doing it under the radar, by the way, because sometimes it is that sensitive that when you meet people who, who don't want it to be known that they're meeting with you, you can't make it public. And the only reason the likes of your show's here today, we have had a number of these conferences, and it doesn't get this publicity, is around the recent... Uh, uh, job that Mary McCardle got. Oh, you wouldn't have been here today, Frank, either. Jared, I have to accept that. I do accept that. And what motivated us to contact you today in relation to this was listening to the likes of Anne Travers talking to us and to other victims who had contacted us and people reminding us of the great horror that was visited upon the country because some of us forget. We do forget. We do forget the people who were killed, the people who were maimed, the people who are still suffering as a result of the activities of the groups that are represented at your meeting today. Well, some of the, the, only some of the activities are, are from the ex-prisoners groups. You know, remember that there was all people involved in this conflict. There was the RUC, there was the UDR, there was the British Army. And we've, we've discussed all of those. Right. We've discussed all of those on this programme through, through the last couple of years as well. Some very high-profile right. discussions, well, including well, Bloody Sunday. The, this is, the reason this conference is, is happening is because we're still trying to deal with issues of the past because the politicians have turned their back on, on dealing with this. They don't want to deal with it because it is, it, it's, it's full of pitfalls. Now, when you meet, uh, the, and I do meet with the families of British soldiers who were killed here, when I do meet people from here who were killed during the conflict, it is not an easy process to go through. It is actually difficult for the victims and for ourselves who do this. We don't walk in there with a hardened heart and listen to the, 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 the victims, uh, people from the victim sector talking and, and, and remain hard hearted. You don't. It's quite emotional all around and it's quite difficult. And some families won't even let it be known that they're meeting ex prisoners. Uh, or ex-combatants because their own families would turn against them. This is a very difficult process and it's been going on now for years without the publicity. And maybe it is time we started getting publicity around it because there's too many people are standing back and denying their responsibility in the conflict or the causes of the conflict. Jared, thanks for your time this morning. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Jared Foster, who's a former member of the INLA, who is one of the delegates at that meeting today. Billy McQuiston is on this line. Billy, good morning. Good morning, Frank. A uh, close association with the UDA. Billy, were you a UDA member? I was, yes. And as you sit round the table today with other members of paramilitary groups like the IRA, the UVF, the INLA, the official IRA, do, do you re- regret your involvement in the UDA? Um, I regret that the actions, any actions that I've taken had to happen, um, Frank. But again, you know, um, I think if you were to, to go into specific uh, cases, um, you know, I mean, then, 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 then it's going to start sounding as if we're just um, uh, um, trying to fall off people or, or, or whatever. But I mean,
mean, I will, I will give you back to the statement, um, the, the ceasefire statement of the Combined Loyalist Community Command, where, where they said that they showed through an object of worse. So, um, I mean, I signed up to that statement, so I don't know whether that answers your question or not, but that's where it would be with it. In relation to the prisoners, and there, there's, there's no doubt I could spend the next 10 minutes rhyming off atrocities carried out by the UDA, in particular the, the slaughter of innocent Catholics. And I could, I could name names, as I say, until I, I, I ran out of screen space here in front of me. When, 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 when you hear of the likes of a former prisoner like Mary McCardle, who was involved in a murder, getting a top job at Stormont, how did it make you feel? Well, I think that it's, uh, that that wasn't the precedent. Um, I mean, uh, the, I think uh, that um, actually the first one that I heard about was actually uh, David Trimble um, employed an ex-Republican prisoner as a, as a special advisor. So, I mean, it's not the first one that has been there. Um, so, I mean... Um, but the important the important element of this is, how moved were you by Ms. Travers, Ann Travers, when she came to the media? How, how moved well, were you by her? My view on it is, Frank, that... Um, that I have fought all my adult life, basically, for the rights of prisoners and the rights of ex-prisoners. So, I mean, I'm, and I think that ex-prisoners are entitled um, to, to whatever position that, that, that they merit. Um, but at the same time, I do think that with rights go responsibilities, and, and that we do have to take on board um, the rights of the victims, which is one of the things that we're trying to do at this conference, actually, here. Um, at every conference that we have, we have um, representatives from the victims groups um, and, and, and representatives of people who are dealing with the past. We are trying to deal with the past. Um, you know, I mean, um, um, Jared had said earlier there that, that, that the politicians aren't facing up to this. There's nowhere in, in any of the agreements uh, up and out does it mention conflict uh, resolution. Um, we are the ones that are trying to deal with conflict resolution. We're trying to deal with them through conferences like this and through our daily work. Um, and, and again, you know, it's only when there's something negative comes out um, that Yeah, but I suppose, Billy, you describe it as something negative coming out. I think most right-thinking people would describe the reaction of Anne Travers as something positive coming out, as right. something that needed to be listened to, as as a voice that needed to be heard. I, I agree with you totally. I mean, the past needs dealt with. And, and again, um, we, we, we are trying to do that. We, we, we will be approaching it here again in this, during this conference, during the next two days with, with the victims, groups, etc., and other... Um, branches of society. Um, we, we are, we have took that bull by the horns and we are trying to address that. And how, how difficult is it being a former political prisoner? Some people, and I see it on the text here in front of me, are using the term terrorist prisoner, but how, how difficult is it being a former prisoner from one of those backgrounds, depending on how you look at it? Well, I mean, there's still a lot of things that are denied to ex-prisoners. There's still a lot of rights that ex-prisoners don't have, um, which are some of the issues that we would be dealing with. Um, and again, you know, I mean, um, that's my uh, forte. I'm an ex-prisoner myself, and I have decided to try and fight for the rights of ex-prisoners. But I agree totally with them um, um, that we have to be sensitive to the needs of victims. Um, and we would be very sensitive about that. Um, we have been in conferences in the past, organised again through um, our, 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 our partnership in the Prisons of Peace. Then we have been involved with um, lots of different people from Republican background um, and from innocent people, etc., we have tried to, to talk to and try to deal with um, their issues. Um, and again, we will continue to do that. Billy, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, Billy McQuiston, former member of the UDA. Billy, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. On 105.8 FM, Freeview Channel 726, and on your Android and your iPhone, this is U105. U105.